Chapter Nineteen of Dash for Khartoum. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Heidi Olson at facebook.com slash j o y v o i dash for khartoum by g a henty chapter nineteen a long search it was with mixed feelings that rupert turned on his camel to take a last view of the camp at Corti. when should he see his countrymen again should he ever see them his journey was sure to be a long one and there would be the constant danger of discovery he had to trust entirely in the fidelity of the three men riding ahead of him it was true that their love of gain was also enlisted on his side but it might well be that they would in time conclude it would be as well to be contented with the goods they had already received in part payment and with the two valuable camels instead of continuing to run the risk of a prolonged journey in his company in order to earn the sum promised upon his arrival in egypt or at a port on the red sea however the die was cast and he had no wish to withdraw from the task he had undertaken and with a wave of his hand towards the distant camp he turned and set his face forwards to the desert the sheik was seated upon one of the aries two laden camels followed each tied with his head rope to the tail of the one in front then followed one of the tribesmen on the other aries with two laden camels three more were led by the other arab rupert himself and ibrahim brought up the rear of the procession each with three loaded camels following that upon which he was riding he wore a cotton cloth which passed over one shoulder and was wrapped round the waist while a second formed a sort of petticoat the sheik would have preferred that he should have dispensed with the cloth over his shoulder but rupert pointed out that this was really essential to him as he could while travelling wrap it round both shoulders and so protect his skin from the rays of the sun which were he naked from the waist would in a very short time raise blisters over the whole of his body his wig with its wild tangle of long hair acted as a capital protection to his head on the saddle was fastened a long arab gun a sword and knife were stuck into his girdle and he carried a long spear in his hand one of the baggage camels was laden with stores for his personal use on the journey consisting of a number of jars of liebig cocoa and milk some tins of tea a box or two of biscuits some tins of preserved vegetables a case or two of arrowroot and a store of medicine chiefly saline draughts quinine and ipecacuanha the eatables he calculated would afford him a morning meal for many months for the main articles of his diet he depended of course upon such food as the arabs would obtain by the end of which time he hoped to have fallen completely into native habits and to be able to content himself with such food as his guides might subsist upon at nightfall they halted at some wells these were farther to the east than those which the desert column had used in its march to metemma rupert had observed that a short time after they had got fairly into the desert the sheik had altered the line on which he was proceeding he had had but little talk with him since the bargain had been concluded as the arab had considered it better that they should not be seen together as some of the other natives in camp might notice it and should they meet afterwards the circumstance might lead to his detection to rupert the course taken was absolutely indifferent he knew that the journey must be a very long one and as he had only to trust to chance and the sagacity of his companions there had been no discussion whatever as to the route to be taken after a time ibrahim weary of the silence urged his camel on until he came up level with that of rupert well ibrahim we are fairly on our way yes my lord we have cut our stick and no mistake rupert smiled ibrahim had picked up his knowledge of english at alexandria and his conversation abounded with slang phrases which he used in perfect seriousness there is no objection to your calling me my lord when we speak in english ibrahim but when we are talking in arabic be sure you always call me hamza that is what i am now what do you think of this journey ibrahim 
Ibrahim shrugged his shoulders. It is all the same to me. Better here than in both. Soldier man go to fight, but very rough in tongue. Call Ibrahim all sorts of names. Sometimes darky, sometimes mate, sometimes call him nigger. That's very bad, sir. One man call him Cocolorum. What is Cocolorum, sir? Rupert laughed. Cocolorum means nothing in particular, Ibrahim. It is rather a friendly sort of address. It means good sort of fellow. That wasn't so bad. No, that not so bad. Then one soldier call him Jocko. That name for a monkey, sir. These things very unpleasant. But they don't mean anything, Ibrahim. They call each other all sorts of names, too. That so, Ibrahim said, nodding his head. Very funny names. Often call each other Blooming something or other. Ibrahim always carry a dictionary. He look out Blooming. Blooming same as Blossoming, means plant out and flower. Ibrahim could not make head or tail of them. Lots of other words, bad words, Ibrahim could not understand. They do not mean anything, Ibrahim. It is just an ugly way of talking. They all mean the same, very much or very great, nothing more or less. Now we had better go on talking Arabic. No words like those in Arabic, Ibrahim said. Arab man say what he wants to say, proper words. I don't know, Ibrahim. When I have seen Arabs quarrelling, they shout and scream at each other, and though I don't know what they say, I should think they were using pretty strong expressions, whatever they may be. Yes, when angry call bad names, one understands that, my lord. But white soldier and sailor use bad words when not angry at all. It is habit, Ibrahim, and a very bad habit. But, as I tell you, it doesn't really mean anything. You see, we have turned east, he went on in Arabic. Ibrahim nodded. Not go straight to Madama, he said. I expect the sheik is going round by Berber. Such proved to be the case, for when they halted for the night, the sheik explained to Rupert, by means of Ibrahim, that he intended to follow the course of the river for the present. He should keep on the edge of the desert until they had passed the point at which the boat expedition had arrived. There would be no chance of the prisoner having been brought down anywhere in the neighbourhood of the British. But as most of the tribes had sent contingents to fight the whites as they advanced against Metemma, the captive might be anywhere beyond the point reached by the expedition, and it would be better to search regularly on their way up, as they might otherwise leave him behind them. Another advantage was that the regular caravan track left the Nile a hundred miles below Dongola, and struck across the desert to the elbow of the river below Berber, and that when he got upon that route, it would be supposed that he had travelled all along by it, and he would thereby avoid the suspicion of having been trading with the British camp. Rupert quite agreed with the justice of this reasoning. The sheik selected a route that led them through a desolate country, and they reached the elbow of the Nile without encountering any natives, save two or three small parties at Wells, from the time they left camp. This course was dictated not only by the reason that he had given Rupert, but by a fear for the safety of the caravan. The tribes along the main routes of travel respected the traders that passed along them. Free passage was essential to all the towns and peoples lying further in the interior, and any interference with the caravan routes would have been resented and punished. But the tribes lying within the great loop formed by the bend of the river were true Ishmaelites, whose hand was against everyone, and who regarded all passing through their territory as lawful prey. The sheik, therefore, conducted the march by routes but little traversed even by the natives, avoiding all localities where they were likely to be met with, and he was greatly pleased when, after ten days' travel, they encamped on the banks of the river just above the elbow. The main caravan track lay upon the opposite side, but at this season of the year, when the Nile was very low, it was fordable at several points and caravans often selected the western bank of the river for their passage. They were now again in a comparatively populous country. Villages surrounded by belts of cultivated land occurred at short intervals, and at these they were received with a hearty welcome, for since the war had begun, trade had come almost to a standstill. Two or three of the camels were loaded with merchandise specially fitted for the wants of the natives, Cheap cottons, tinware, trinkets, iron heads of tools, knives, cheap silk handkerchiefs and scarves for the women. 
These had been bought from some enterprising traders who had set up a store at Corti. A few of the bales were unpacked at the first village at which they arrived, small presents were given as usual to the chief man of the place, and a brisk trade at once commenced. As the camels were fully loaded, Rupert wondered what the sheik would do with the goods he obtained in exchange, which consisted chiefly of native cottons and other articles considerably more bulky than those which he gave for them but he found that he had entered into an arrangement with the head of the village by which the latter agreed to take charge of all the merchandise until his return it will be perfectly safe the sheik said if i do not return for a couple of years if i never return it will be no great loss since i have purchased the goods with the monies i have received from you if i return this way my camels will be unloaded and i shall pick up the goods at the various villages through which i pass and bring them all down here and then sell them to some trader who has boats in which he will take them down the river. Rupert was now called upon to play his part in earnest. He and Ibrahim were treated by the sheik when in villages as two slaves, and while he and his companions exhibited their goods and drove bargains with the villagers, Rupert and Ibrahim unloaded camels, drove them out to pasture, and took them down to the river to drink, taking their meals as they could, apart from the rest on these occasions the stores were untouched and rupert and his companion made their meals on dry dates and cakes of coarse flour baked in the ashes of the fire ibrahim was fortunately a light-hearted fellow and made the best of matters joking at the idea of the arabs feasting upon their stew of kid or mutton while they had to content themselves with coarse fare rupert cared nothing about the food one way or the other he was now really engaged in the search for edgar there was moreover the excitement caused by the risk of discovery when in the villages he seldom opened his lips except to reply briefly to his companion's talk for a chance word might be overheard when he spoke it was in a guttural voice as if he suffered from some affection of the tongue or malformation of the mouth which prevented him speaking clearly and thus had any villager overheard the conversation between him and ibrahim his defective arabic would pass unnoticed each day after getting away from their halting place he learned from the sheik what he had gathered in the village the natives were all heartily sick of the present state of affairs they had no market for their goods and were deprived of the trade upon which they had hitherto relied a few restless spirits had joined the Mahdi's people and had gone to war but the cultivators in general sighed for a return of the old state of things and of the peaceful days they enjoyed while under the rule of egypt even the tribesmen of the interior were highly dissatisfied none had gained anything from the war except those who had taken an actual part in the capture of berber khartoum or other cities these had obtained a considerable amount of plunder but beyond this all were worse off than before there was no longer any profitable employment for their camels for trade purposes, and the promises of the Mahdi had been altogether falsified. Many of the tribes on the other side of the river had gone down to fight under Osman Digma at Suakim, but instead of the promises of victory being fulfilled, they had suffered terribly, had lost vast numbers of men, and Suakim was as far off being taken as ever berber itself the great market and centre of trade at that part of the country was all said like a dead city the shops were closed the traders had been either killed or fled the markets were empty the mahdi soldiers treated the inhabitants as slaves the sheik satisfied himself that there was no rumour current of there being any white prisoners in the hands of the tribesmen thou ate prisoners at khartoum the people said Gordon was killed, and great numbers with him, but others of the Egyptian officers and traders, with their wives and families, were made slaves and divided among the Mahdi's officers. But of the white soldiers who had come across the desert, they had heard of no prisoners being taken. Where should they be? they asked. They beat the Arabs in two battles, they carried off their wounded on their camels, and had any been left behind them, they would have been killed at once. Why do you ask? the sheik had replied that the merchant far down the river from whom he had purchased his goods had told him that the whites were always ready to pay a good ransom to recover any of their colour who might have been taken captive 
and had advised him if he should hear of any prisoners in the hands of the arabs to ask what they would sell them for so that on his next journey he might bring money or goods to redeem them the villagers had told him that this could not be for that the mahdi required all captives to be sent to him and that all who refused to acknowledge him as the prophet were at once put to death he had always appeared perfectly satisfied with this explanation and had turned the conversation to other topics this does not show he said to rupert that there are no captives in the hands of the tribesmen in the interior if they had them they would keep it secret at any rate as long as the white troops are on the river they can only be holding them for the sake of obtaining a ransom but i do not think there would be much chance that your brother is in these parts for had he been his captors would before now have sent in a messenger to one of your camps saying that he was in their hands and asking what ransom would be given for him it is far to the south that we must look for him but at the same time it is wise to make every inquiry as we go along so that we shall be always looking before us and not wondering whether we have left him behind when they reached a village a few miles below berber they stopped for three or four days the sheik's two followers went alone into the city to make inquiries they returned after being absent for three days saying that it was certain that there was no white captive in the hands of the Maldives people there they had talked to several tribesmen who had fought at matema these knew that a white prisoner had been taken by a party of arabs of the jarin tribe trouble had arisen owing to the sheik refusing to give him up and he had fled in the night with his party taking the prisoner with him but beyond the fact that he had crossed the river none had heard anything of him as there was now no motive for going to berber and permission to trade could only be obtained by a large present to the mahdi's governor the party started early the next morning struck out into the desert and made a long detour before two days later they came down again upon the river bank above the city then they continued their journey and some days later crossed the river at a ford some miles below metemma it was certain wherever edgar might be it would not be in the neighbourhood of that town for some weeks the journey continued at times they left the river bank and journeyed considerable distances to visit tribes or villages situated in the interior sometimes the caravan was divided in two a portion remaining in charge of one of the sheik's followers with ibrahim and rupert with a bulk of the camels and baggage while the sheik with his other follower and two or three camels made excursions to villages at a distance in that case he took but few goods with him so as not to tempt the cupidity of the tribesmen or of any parties of the mahdi's men he might come across by this time rupert had made considerable progress in arabic thanks to his continually conversing in that language and his risk of detection had greatly decreased once or twice a week fresh dye was applied to him from head to foot he was now accustomed to the scantiness of his clothing and had completely caught the manners and gestures of the natives the colour of his eyes was the sole point that even a close observer would detect as being peculiar in his appearance and he had fallen into the habit of keeping them partly closed and the darkened eyelashes greatly lessened the chance of their colour being noticed he had moreover by the advice of one of the doctors before leaving taken with him a bottle of belladonna and a small dose of this prior to entering any populous village had the effect of enlarging the pupils and thus of darkening the general effect of the eyes the sheik frequently crossed the river with one of his followers and made excursions among the tribes on the opposite bank but with all their inquiries no news whatever was obtained of any white captive it was not until three months after leaving korti that the caravan approached khartoum it was more likely that news would be obtained here than elsewhere but the sheik had been unwilling to enter the town until rupert's arabic would fairly pass muster but even he now agreed that there was little chance of his detection in any sort of casual conversation in khartoum there would be people from all parts of the soudan and any slight peculiarity of accent would be little likely to be noticed besides in a city there would be less chance of any one closely questioning the slave of a passing merchant than would be the case in a village before going into the town one of the sheik's followers was sent on ahead with a camel with presents for some of the mahdi's officials and upon his return with a document 
authorizing the sheik to enter the city and dispose of his merchandise the caravan set forward it was with mingled emotions that rupert entered the town here perhaps edgar was a captive or had possibly been put to death for refusing to acknowledge the modi here gordon had fallen a victim to fanatical zeal the hesitation of the english government and the treachery of some of the troops he had led to victory here hundreds of egyptian men women and children had been slain here were the headquarters of the false prophet who had brought such ruin and destruction over fertile provinces upon showing the pass to the officials at the ferry leading across to the city a soldier had been told off to accompany them and he conducted them to an empty caravansary in the city one of the arabs was dispatched with two unladen camels to the market-place where he bought a store of provender brought in by the country people on his return rupert and ibrahim fed the animals which were fastened by ropes from their headstalls to rings in the wall of the courtyard and then sallied out with one of the arabs into the town it was still a busy place although its aspect had greatly changed since its capture there were no egyptian soldiers in their grey cotton uniforms and fezzes no officials or traders in european costume in the streets and the shops which had formerly held large assortments of goods brought up from egypt were occupied by natives vending the absolute necessaries of life the modi soldiers in their cotton shirts decorated with rags of coloured cloth and carrying guns lounged about the streets and the poorer part of the native population went about with a cowed and dejected air food was scarce and dear for although the modi by promising protection to all coming into trade had endeavoured to induce the agricultural population to bring in their produce for sale the invitation was very partially accepted the country round indeed had been swept clean of its grain during the progress of the siege and the fear of the modi's followers was so great that the peasants contented themselves with tilling only sufficient for their needs the arab muttered curses beneath his breath as he walked along while rupert and ibrahim followed in silence seemingly paying no attention to what was going on around them when they returned to the caravansary they found the sheik with several of the native shopkeepers engaged with him in conversation at his orders rupert and ibrahim at once began to undo some of the bales and held up the goods for inspection the sheik named the prices he required these were at once declared by the natives to be impossible the sheik simply ordered his assistants to fasten up the bales again i have brought them all the way from egypt and i am not going to give them away it is not every one in times like this who will risk his beasts and his goods on such an adventure the traders have all gone down the river with the white men it may be months or years before a caravan route is open again who is going to bring up goods to sell when there is nothing for his camels to carry down again and when the whole country is disturbed there is neither law nor order in the land i shall journey on to el obaid or kasala i shall get what price i like to ask there the traders poured out a torrent of expostulation they would see the goods again doubtless they were of a better quality than they supposed and so the bargain was recommenced and after some hours a considerable portion of the goods that had been brought up were disposed of in each case the traders arranged to come late in the evening with their servants to fetch away the goods they had bought it would never do one said to let it be known that we had money sufficient to make such purchases it is only by assuming the greatest poverty that we can carry on our business unmolested and only a few of the cheapest goods can be displayed to the eyes of the public the rest being hidden away to be brought out privately for the benefit of some special customer the sheik was well pleased with the result of his traffic the prices he had charged were five or sixfold more than those that the goods had cost and he sent out one of his followers to purchase a kid which was presently converted into a stew after this was eaten he went out with one of his followers leaving the other to deliver the goods to their purchasers when it became quite dark the traders arrived one by one each with one or two porters to carry away the goods these were paid for in cash drawn from buried hoards the sheik was late before he returned he told rupert that he had met a kinsman of his who was now an officer of the mahdi and had had a long conversation with him he believes in the mahdi he said and has faith that he is going to conquer the world 
I told him that finding no traders would hire my camels, I had this time brought up a load on my own account, and that it seemed to me there was money to be made if one could purchase some of the people who had been enslaved when the city was taken. He said that this could not be, that the greater part of the traders had been killed, and that all who remained were now zealous followers of the Mahdi. Lupton Bay was held as a slave by the Mahdi himself, and had to run before him when he rode. There would be no possibility of releasing him or the others in the Mahdi's hands. I inquired whether any of the Kafirs who had come to Metemma had been taken prisoners. He said they had heard of but one, who was reported by a black slave to be in the hands of a petty sheik, who was living at an oasis in the desert some nine days' journey from here. It had already been reported to the Mahdi that this man had taken a Kafir prisoner at Metemma and had refused to give him up and had escaped with the kafir in the night, and strict orders had been issued for his arrest. But nothing had been heard of him until the slave brought the news. The Mahdi sent up three officers and forty men on camels with orders to destroy everything, and to kill all they found, with the exception of the sheik himself and his white captive, who were to be brought here to await his pleasure. They went, but though this is two months ago, they have never returned. Another party was sent three weeks later to the place to order them to return instantly. But when they arrived there, they found the oasis deserted. Two skeletons were found, but the sun and the vultures had done their work, and whether they had belonged to the troop that went or to the Arabs there, none could say. It may be they found that the sheik and his party had travelled to El Obeid or elsewhere and had pursued them. But so far, no news has been heard of them, and the whole matter is a mystery. What do you think has happened, Sheik? I know not what to think. My kinsman said that the black slave reported there were but twenty men in all with the Sheik, and not more than half of these could be considered as fighting men. Therefore, they could not have resisted for a moment the force against them. It is possible they may have fled into the desert. The tribes know of wells whose existence is kept a secret from all, and it may be that such a well was known to the Sheik, and that he has made for it. It may be that a negro guide led the party in pursuit. Misfortune may have happened. They may have lost their way and all perished from thirst, though it would be strange indeed were none able to make their way back to the oasis. What think you we had better do, Sheik? This gives us some indication at least of a direction in which my brother was taken. The Sheik sat for some minutes without answering. It is difficult, he said at last. The Sheik, el is as i have told you a wanderer i have heard of him though i have never met him his father was a powerful sheik but as a young man el bakat killed the son of another sheik of the same tribe and fled later on he gathered a few followers and was in the service of the slave dealers who go down to the great lakes of late years since gordon broke up the slave trade he has returned at times and remained for weeks and sometimes for months in the part of the country occupied by his tribe for it is so many years now since he killed his man that vengeance is no longer hot against him. He has the name of being a headstrong man, and indeed he must be so, or he would never have embroiled himself with the Mahdi's people. For if he had been driven out of his oasis, he would know that there is no safety for him anywhere near here. But where he has gone to, no man could say. One might as well try to follow the flight of a vulture. He may have gone down near the coast. He may have made his way to the confines of Abyssinia. He may have journeyed away towards the lakes where Emin Pasha still rules in the name of Egypt. There is just one chance. He may be hiding in the desert, and before he starts on a long journey, he may return to the oasis or may send a messenger to see if it is still occupied by the Mahdi's men. I think that our best chance is to proceed thither at once and to wait there for a while to see if any come from him. If at the end of a fortnight or three weeks none come, we can then decide in which direction to set out upon the search again. This proposal seemed to Rupert to offer more prospect of success than any other, and on the following morning the caravan started, the camels now carrying scarce half the weight with which they had left Corti. As the sheik had learned from his kinsman the name of the oasis to which the troop had been sent, he had no difficulty in obtaining from some of the tribesmen in the city precise directions as to the route to be pursued, and ten days after leaving Khartoum they arrived there. The place was absolutely deserted. 
but they established themselves near the well, and the camels found abundant grazing as the crops had shot up again with great vigour during the time that had elapsed since they had been cut. The sheik at once pointed out to Rupert that although El Bakot and some of his followers were down at Metemma, the probability was that his people had occupied the place for some time, as cultivation had been carried on to a considerable extent. Here are where the tents stood, he said and see he evidently brought back a good deal of plunder for he are some empty tins and jars scattered about they remained for three weeks in camp one of the party had been always on the watch but no human being had been seen to approach during that time the sheik and rupert had many discussions as to the direction in which the fugitives had probably travelled and finally decided that the probabilities were in favour of his having taken the southern route and made for the country ruled over by Amin in the first place he was familiar with this line and in the second he would be safe from the modi when he reached amin's country it is rich and fertile he said and probably amin when he finds he is altogether cut off from the north will try to open a way down to zanzibar and el bakot may find good employment for his camels as at any rate there were reasons why the fugitives should have chosen this route more than any other it was decided to follow it End of chapter 19. Recording by Heidi Olson at facebook.com slash j-o-y-v-o-i. Chapter 20 of Dash for Khartoum. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Dash for Khartoum by George Alfred Henty. Chapter 20. Found. Before starting upon their journey, the sheik said to Edgar, On our journey here we travelled by unfrequented tracks, and it was sufficient to cover you up, so that none who passed us should notice you. But it will be different now. Therefore, we must dress you in our own fashion. Your hair can never be made to look like ours, and must be bound in a turban. With that, and a burnous, your face and hands only will be visible. These are now so darkened by the sun that their fairness will scarce be noticed. But the women will prepare a dye, which will darken you to our shade. I wish you to dress like us for another reason. You have done us great service, and though you will not change your religion, I regard you almost as one of the tribe, and do not wish you henceforth to consider yourself as a slave. You are improving fast in our language, and if you speak but little, you will pass unnoticed. Some men are more silent than others, and you need speak but little when strangers are with us. As one of ourselves, you will attract less notice than as a slave. None will say, where did you get that fellow? To what part did he belong? Was he brought from the Great Lakes? Are you inclined to sell him? He is a likely youth. What will you take for him? I am ready to do what you think best, Sheik, Edgar said, and indeed there can be no doubt that I am far less likely to be noticed, if wrapped up in your fashion, than if I went half-clothed as a slave. Accordingly, a low, close-fitting turban was wound round Edgar's head, and he was wrapped up in loose cotton garments, covered with a burnous, the hood of which came over his head. His face, hands, and neck were slightly stained, and when this was done, the Arabs admitted that they would not for a moment have suspected him of being other than he seemed. Most of the women, children, and old men were left behind at the wadi. The goats and sheep would supply them with milk and cheese. There was a sufficient supply of grain for their use until the crops that had been sown as soon as they arrived should come into bearing, and when all preparations were complete, the party started on its way. It consisted of twelve men mounted on camels, while two other animals followed behind each of these. 
the sheik rode at the head of the party upon the horse that had been captured from the Mahdists. amina also had a camel to herself while the four other women who accompanied the party rode two on a camel yusuf and five or six lads of from fifteen to seventeen years old walked by the side of the camels the lead camels were but lightly loaded carrying only the tents cooking utensils provender for the journey and food and water for the party and edgar could see no reason why yusuf and the boys should not have ridden except that it was the custom for slaves and lads to walk it was a six days journey to the point they aimed at and the marches were long ones the supply of water carried was ample for the wants of the party and the camels were given a good drink before starting on the fourth day's journey they were turned loose each evening on arriving at a halting place and left to pick up what subsistence they could from the bushes a good feed being given to them each morning from the provender they carried as they could have carried much more edgar inquired why enough had not been brought to give them a feed at night as well but the arab of whom he had asked the question said that it was better for them to browse at night as the moisture in the herbage enabled them to do with much less water than if they had been fed entirely upon grain edgar was very glad when the desert journey was over the glare of the sun from the sand and the rocks was almost blinding and the wraps in which he was muffled up greatly added to his discomfort on arriving at the cultivated land the same picture presented itself that he had seen near khartoum everywhere the villages were almost entirely deserted and the fields lay waste the blighting influence of the mahdi seemed to weigh upon the whole country the few natives that remained fled in fear at the sight of the strangers and the old people they met with in the villages were crushed with grief and despondency of what use to cultivate the land when the mahdists might at any moment sweep off the crops even should they gather the grain where could they sell it there were markets indeed still open but the mahdi's tax-gatherers would demand a proportion of the proceeds which would sweep away all their profits what was to become of them allah alone knew edgar was filled with pity for these poor creatures and over and over again thought with astonishment of the policy which after sending a force to within a short distance of khartoum amply sufficient to have crushed the mahdi and to have restored peace and comfort to the population of the soudan had withdrawn them when the goal was all but reached and left the unhappy people to their fate after journeying for some days they passed a plain strewn with skeletons you see these the sheik said they are the remains of the army of hicks pasha here they were attacked by the mahdi's army they defended themselves bravely but they could neither advance nor retreat and at last they were vanquished by thirst and fatigue they were slaughtered as they stood hicks pasha and a band of officers rode right into the midst of the mahdists and died fighting there there were i heard two or three kaffirs with him besides many egyptian officers the black troops fought splendidly but the egyptians made a poor stand but it came to the same in the end what could they do against the followers of allah but the egyptians are followers of allah too edgar said and yet as you say they are but poor fighters no no sheik i admit the extraordinary bravery of the tribesmen i fought against them at suakim and saw them charge down upon our square at abu Klea. they had no fear of death and no man ever fought more bravely but it was a matter of race rather than religion your people have always been free for the rule of egypt was after all a nominal one the egyptians have been slaves for centuries and have lost their fighting power in the old old days thousands of years ago of which we have records in our sacred book and which we have learned from other sources 
the egyptians were among the most warlike of people and carried their arms far and wide but for many hundreds of years now they have been ruled by strangers it was not very long ago that our people fought a great tribe in the south of africa a tribe who knew nothing of allah and had in fact no religion at all and yet they fought as stoutly and as well as your people have done here it is a matter of race they were just as ready to die as were your tribesmen and that not because they believed as you do that death in battle would open the gates of paradise to them but simply because it was the will of their king mashallah the sheik said stroking his beard they must have been brave indeed to throw away their lives if they knew nothing of paradise merely at the will of one man that was folly indeed a man has but one life it is his all why should he part with it did they love this king of theirs i do not know that they loved him edgar said but they feared him their laws were very cruel ones and it was death to turn back in battle they had better have cut his throat and have gone about their own business the sheik said why should one man be master of the lives of all his people is this so among the whites it is so in some countries but not in others edgar said some countries are ruled over by men chosen by the people themselves and the power of peace and war and of making laws of all kinds is in the hands of these men and the king has very little power in other countries the king is absolute if he says it is war it is war the sheik was silent but why should people fight and die because one man tells them he said after a pause it is astonishing but it is just the same thing with the people here and the mahdi edgar said he tells them to fight and they fight if he told them to scatter to their homes they would do so the sheik made no further remark but it was evident to edgar that he was thinking out the problems that had presented themselves to him for some hours afterward he suddenly remarked we who live in tents and wander where we will are the only free men it is more clear to me than ever when they were within a day's journey of el obed they met one of the sheik's followers who had left the wadi four days before the rest with instructions to go to the city and find out whether it would be safe to enter he halted his camel when he reached that of the sheik you must go no nearer the city my father he said i have learned that orders have been received by the mahdi's governor to arrest you and all with you should you present yourselves there there is much talk about a party of soldiers who went into the desert to arrest you having disappeared altogether others have been sent to find them but have discovered no traces of them so there are orders that any of our tribe from the desert are to be closely questioned any who admit a knowledge of you are to be sent to khartoum i was questioned at the gates but as i said that i had come straight from khartoum and knew not of what was passing in the desert i was passed in without further inquiry i took up my abode with the people you told me of and they have found out for me what i have told you it is but three days since the orders concerning you were received i thought there might be danger at el obed the sheik said calmly we will turn off so as to avoid the city and will make south to join the white pasha for a while it would not be safe anywhere here without further words he turned his camel from the track they had been following and bore away more to the south think you that the white pasha will be able to maintain his position the sheik shook his head for a time he may but in the end he must either surrender or try to strike down to the sea his troops will weary at last even if they are not beaten by the army the mahdi will send against them they will say why should we go on fighting what good can come of our holding out when no aid can possibly reach us from egypt the mahdi will be glad to come to terms with them and allow them to live there in quiet 
with their wives and families and their possessions if they will acknowledge him and hand over the white pasha with the two or three white officers he has with him but that will make no difference to me i know all the country by the great lakes there are arab traders there in plenty who buy slaves and ivory and take them down to the coast i can find employment with them for my camels and can stay with them until it is safe to return this cannot go on for ever besides in times of trouble events pass quickly out of men's minds and in a year the modests will have forgotten my name as to the loss of their forty men what is it they have lost thousands since the war began when we get to the white pasha sheik would you hand me over to him if he offered you a ransom for me no the sheik said decidedly i should not take you near him why should i part with you you have brought us good fortune thanks to you we defeated the modests and captured their camels and all that they had besides i like you why should i part with you what good would it do you with me you are no longer treated as a slave but as one of my own people what would you be with the white pasha an officer of his troops getting no pay and running the risk of being one day seized and sent with the others a prisoner to khartoum i have no desire to stay with the white pasha edgar said i would rather be with you than in so hopeless a position as he is but i might make my way down to the coast never the sheik said at least never alone there are fierce tribes between the lakes and the sea no white man could get through alone he could only do it by going with a great band of fighting men and carriers and by buying his way by presents through the great tribes and fighting his way through the small ones you may travel down to the sea some day with me if i join the caravans of the arabs and then if there are countrymen of yours on the coast as i have heard and they would pay me a good ransom for you we may see about it you are ungrateful to wish to leave me not ungrateful sheik for you and your wife have treated me with great kindness but it is natural that one should wish to go to one's own people had you been taken a prisoner and carried to england however well you were treated you would sigh for your free life in the desert for your people and friends and would escape if you saw a chance it is human nature to love the land where one was born whatever that land may be that is true el bakhat admitted but you cannot escape now there is nowhere for you to go to that is true sheik and i should be well content did i know that you were travelling straight either for suakim or zanzibar for at either place i know that i could obtain from my countrymen money to pay any ransom you might set upon me even a sum that would buy you fast camels and much goods and make you a wealthy man in your tribe but i am not content to wait for years you are not thinking of making your escape now el bakhat asked looking scrutinizingly at edgar under his heavy eyebrows no sheik edgar answered from the day that you captured me i made up my mind that i would escape sooner or later whatever the risk but i knew well that i could never traverse the country until i could speak the language like a native i have made great progress and can now understand all that is said and can talk freely and easily but not so that i could travel alone as a native it will be months yet before i can do that nor after the kindness with which you have treated me would i leave you suddenly without warning when i feel that i can safely travel alone i shall give you fair warning i shall say to you sheik if you will now travel with me to suakim or some other port where i can obtain money for paying you a fair ransom i will remain with you until such ransom is paid into your hands if you will not do so i shall consider myself free to escape when i can of course it will be open to you to treat me again as a slave and to use all vigilance to prevent my leaving you but i shall consider that by giving you fair warning 
I shall be free to use my best endeavors to get away. You speak boldly, the sheik said, but you speak fairly. Do you give me your promise not to attempt to escape until after warning me? Yes, I give you that promise, sheik. It is well, El Bakhat said gravely. I know that you would not lie to me. After you have given me warning, I shall know what to do. So saying, he got up and walked away to his tent. Three days later, as the caravan was halting at a well, Yusuf, who had gone out with the camels, ran in. There is a large body of men, some on foot and some on horses, approaching from the south. How far are they off? the sheik asked as he leapt to his feet. Scarce half a mile, the negro replied. Then it is too late for flight, the sheik said, reseating himself. They would be here long before we could saddle our camels. It is doubtless a body of the Mahdi's troops, but if they come from the south, they will have heard nothing against us. When the Mahdists rode up, the sheik rose and saluted their commander. Who are you? the officer asked. I am a humble person, one El Bakhat of the Jaren tribe, traveling with my camels and some little merchandise. Have you the permit of one of the Mahdi's officers to trade? No, my lord, I did not know that it was needful. Assuredly it is needful, the officer said. Your camels and goods are forfeited, and you yourself and your people must travel with us to El Obed where inquiries will be made about you. My lord, the sheik said, I am a poor man and have done no harm. After fighting against the infidels, I went back to my people with such spoil as we had taken and have dwelt there quietly and was ignorant that it needed a permission for me to journey with my camels. Well, if you can prove that, when you get to the city, the officer said, the governor may take a lenient view of the case and may content himself by taking a portion only of your camels as a fine. But if you are lying, it will be worse for you. Remember now that you are prisoners and will be shot down if one of you attempts to escape. The sheik bowed submissively. The officer ordered some of his men to keep a rigid watch over the prisoners and then paid no further attention to them. The sheik re-entered his tent and sat down, stern and silent, without speaking. Amina, who had heard what had passed, was in the greatest state of alarm, but saw that her husband was not to be spoken to at present. She went to the door of her tent and beckoned to Edgar, in whom she felt the most implicit confidence. "'You heard what has passed, Muley?' "'I heard, lady. The position is full of danger.' You are fertile in expedients. Can you not suggest something? You see, if we are taken to El Obed, where they have had news of the expedition sent from Khartoum and its disappearance in the desert, my husband would be sent in chains to the Mahdi, and you know what his fate would be then, while the least that will befall us all will be to be sold into slavery. What, then, do you advise? With your permission, I will think it over, Edgar replied. The position is a difficult one. The danger is, as you say, great. Go then and think it over, Muley. Edgar went out of the tent and squatted down, a position which had at first been very fatiguing, but to which he was now accustomed, by the embers of the fire before it, and thought over what had best be done. For himself, he felt sure that he could make his escape, for, though a general watch might be kept, one man could doubtless crawl away in the darkness. But he felt that he could not abandon the sheik in a moment of danger. It was, in fact, owing to himself that the sheik was now in this present position. It was true that the Arab had refused to give him up to the Mahdi's people at Metama, not from any love towards him, but of his own obstinate and headstrong disposition. However, that refusal, whatever its motive, had undoubtedly saved his life, and, moreover, the sheik had behaved with great kindness to him since, and he felt that it was clearly his duty to do all in his power to assist him now. But how? 
it was upwards of an hour before he rose from the fire and again entered the sheik's tent the sheik was sitting smoking gravely amina was baking some bread over the embers in the middle of the tent what is your counsel muley she asked i see no plan he said by which my lord can get away with all his followers and camels one or two might steal out from the camp and i thought at first that if yusuf and myself who would not be so closely watched as he will be for there are two sentries outside the tent could manage to steal out with our guns and to open fire in the darkness upon the camp the modest thinking they were attacked would seize their arms and run out and in the confusion my lord and you and some of the others might make their escape but this plan is full of danger and it might not succeed for they might suspect that those who attacked them were of your party and a portion would remain to keep guard over you this then should be the last resource for if the attempt was made and failed escape would be more difficult than ever it appears to me that the first thing to do is to try and bribe the chief at present he only suspects you of trading without a license and were my lord to see him and to offer him half the camels and the burdens to let him go free with the remainder he might accept it if that failed we can still try my plan i would take my gun and crawl out with yusuf i would go two or three hundred yards away to the right and would then fire as quickly as i could moving while i did so so that they might think that there were many attacking them then my lord in the confusion you and your wife with the child should try to make your escape as soon as the camp is aroused and they are advancing against us we would move round to the left of the camp and you would join us there and make straight across the country and be far away by daylight but how could we travel without camels the sheik broke in impatiently they would surely overtake us before long there are deserted villages in which we might hide until the pursuit is over edgar said as they would gain all the camels and goods it would matter little to them that three or four persons had escaped not until they reached el obed the sheik said then they would learn who we were and would scour the country for us camels we must have if we are to escape besides i should be a ruined man and might as well be killed at once not altogether ruined sheik edgar said you remember that we buried many of your valuables and arms at the wadi we could never get there without camels the sheik said gloomily it might be done sheik several men accompanied the camels on foot and we could perform the journey so on our way back but i should not counsel that my idea was that we should get as far away from here as possible and should then leave your wife and child in some village we could take with us goods which would be quite sufficient to ensure a welcome for her until you return then i should propose that you and i with yusuf who is certainly faithful should make our way down on foot as arab fighting men to berber and then on to osman digma who is we know close to suakim thence we might readily find means of escaping him and entering the town and then as i told you i can promise you a ransom that would enable you to buy more camels and goods than you have lost here to return to your wife and child and take them with you to your wadi as to camels i do not altogether despair of getting some they are as usual grazing outside the camp they know yusuf's voice and mine and when we first escape we might lead four of them away and take them to the left of the camp where you are afterwards to meet us before morning we could be very many miles away ah if you could do that the chief said showing for the first time a lively interest in the matter it might be possible however i will try first of all if the officer will accept a bribe if he will do so it will give us two days start and we can then arrange matters as you say without another word he rose and went to the door of the tent 
the two sentries placed there stepped forward and told him that their orders were that he was not to leave it i wish not to leave it he said i desire only to speak to your commander i have something of importance to say to him will you pray him to come to me one of the sentries at once went across to the commander's tent and shortly returned with him master the sheik said i have done wrong in journeying without a license but i came from the desert and did not know the law i must pay for my fault though i cannot think that the commander at el obed would be hard upon one who has erred from ignorance however as it is urgent for me to press on my journey i will relinquish to you one-third of my camels and their burdens if you will let us travel on with the others and give us a permit from yourself so that none may molest us in the future as the officer had no suspicion that the arab's first story was untrue he hesitated then he said not so all your camels are forfeited for breaking the laws of the mahdi but those who err in ignorance are surely not punished like those who err wilfully the sheik urged but i am pressed for time i am journeying south to the tents of my wife's father who has sent to say that he is sick unto death and wishes to see her before he dies be content my lord and take half the camels the officer thought that the offer was a good one it was probable that the governor of el obed would not find the arab more than half his camels seeing that he had broken the law inadvertently and in that case he himself would have but a small share in the spoil whereas if he consented to the proposal the camels would all fall to himself saving one or two he might give to his officers to induce them to keep silence as to the affair i will be more merciful than you deserve arab he said i will take half your camels with their loads but see that you cheat me not if you do it will be worse for you divide the animals and goods to-morrow morning in two equal parts i will take that which pleases me most i have spoken and turning upon his heel he went back to his tent edgar standing within heard the conversation you have heard the sheik said when he had entered half my property is gone but i have freedom and the other half i have had worse misfortunes than this so far your counsel has turned out well muley now about the future we shall have but four days start he will reach el obed by evening the day after to-morrow there he will hear that he has let slip through his fingers the man for whom all the country is in search and horsemen will be dispatched instantly in pursuit probably they will be here the next evening it is but a reprieve journey as fast as we will they will soon overtake us yes if we pursue our course in the same direction sheik but this we must not do i should say that as soon as the division is made we should start south it is as well that they should see the direction in which we are travelling then as soon as we are well out of sight of the camp i should say let us break up the party into six or eight parts and bid them travel in different directions east and west and then make to the point where we arrived from the desert and strike across to the wadi a party like ours would be noticed at once but two or three persons each with a camel carrying their belongings would be scarce observed and the mahdi's horsemen asking if a caravan of ten camels had passed would be told that no such party had been seen at any rate most of your men would be able to regain the wadi and there to await your return then i should propose that you on one camel and your wife and child on another with such goods as you require to pay your way with myself on foot dressed as formerly as a slave should strike in the direction of khartoum but keeping this side of the river until we reach berber of course you could take yusuf with you or not as you might choose but i think that you would find him useful you would like him to go the sheik answered in a tone of suspicion for it flashed across him that if edgar and yusuf made common cause he would be at their mercy 
i should like him to go sheik the negro has always been civil and obliging to me from the day when i thrashed his companion and if when we arrive at a port on the red sea you are willing to part with him i will gladly arrange to buy him of you at any reasonable price that you might name so be it the sheik said the matter is settled next morning the sheik and his followers were on foot early they divided the camels with the greatest care into two portions debating earnestly on the merits of each animal then the goods which were of but trifling value were also divided when all was done the mahdi's officer came down and closely inspected both lots of animals there is nothing to choose between them he said you have made a just division i will take the right-hand lot and the horse is of course mine and to the disgust of the sheik he ordered one of the followers to take it to his tent here is a permit for you to journey and trade as you will the soldiers were already under arms the arabs hastily packed their tents and cooking pots on the camels that remained to them and the two parties set off almost at the same instant in two opposite directions when they had travelled for an hour the sheik halted his caravan and explained the situation to his followers as soon as the mahdists reach the town they will hear of us and hot pursuit will be instantly set on foot therefore it is necessary for the present to abandon our plans and for you to return at once to the wadi from which we started but if our pursuers obtain news of a caravan of our size they will be sure to overtake us therefore it is also necessary that we should separate at once let each man therefore take his camel his wife and his belongings and journey singly let some go east and some west and making a circuit to avoid el obed reach the edge of the desert as best you may do not wait there for each other but let each as he reaches it strike across to the wells when you reach the wadi wait there for me i will go with my wife and muley and yusuf we shall take two camels and journey north there i hope to obtain a sum for the surrender of muley which will more than repay us the loss we have suffered to-day the arabs at once obeyed the orders of the sheik and in a few minutes were speeding across the country we will go on for another three or four hours march the sheik said before we turn to the east our pursuers will be sure to inquire for us at every place they pass and if they hear that solitary camelmen have been seen making their way across the country they will turn off at once in pursuit it is therefore better that they should move off some distance before we turn off the sheik had chosen two camels which though not remarkable for their looks were of better blood than the rest and more capable of performing long journeys he and his wife and child rode on one of the animals edgar with yusuf behind him on the other at noon they turned off from the southern course they had before been pursuing they continued their journey until long after sunset and then halted for a few hours to rest the camels the moon rose at eight o'clock and as soon as it was up they started again travelling now in a north-easterly direction in order to throw their pursuers off their track at daybreak they halted again this time in a grove a fire was lit and yusuf cooked some meal cakes and a bountiful feed of grain was given to each animal as speed was less an object than secrecy no move was made until nightfall in order that they might pass through the villages unobserved the journey was continued until the following morning when they again halted they were now following a track which would the sheik said lead them after a few miles into the main road between el obed and khartoum this time the halt was of but a few hours duration as they hoped that they had baffled their pursuers and could now travel without attracting any special attention they had reached the road and were proceeding along it when yusuf saw dust rising in the distance he called the attention of the sheik to it and the camels were pressed forward to their utmost speed but camels will seldom go far beyond their accustomed walk 
and it soon became apparent that they were being rapidly overtaken by the strangers who were pressing on behind by this time it could be seen that the party following them were also mounted on camels two riders had detached themselves from the main body and were coming on at a rapid pace they must be mounted on harry's the sheik said see how they come along there is no avoiding them they are not the mahdi's men yusuf said presently i can see by their dress that they are in arab robes they are riding for a purpose the sheik said or they would not travel so fast and yet if their purpose were hostile they would hardly leave their followers so far behind if they know aught of el bakhat they will know that he is not a man to surrender without resistance prepare your gun muley methinks there are but two men with the four camels behind and if we slay these first we shall have no difficulty with them the strangers came rapidly up and as they approached the sheik saw that they were an arab trader and a wild-looking native as they came up they reined in their camels and the trader gave the usual arab salutation which was responded to by the sheik two or three of the usual ceremonial sentences were repeated on both sides my brother's name is el bakhat the newcomer said my name is my own the sheik replied and is no concern of strangers i come as a friend the arab said i arrived at el obed yesterday and heard that a body of horsemen had set out in pursuit of you yesterday evening some returned with a prisoner who said that your party had separated and that you were travelling north two parties of horsemen were ordered to start at daybreak thinking that you might make for khartoum i set out at once to warn you by this time the wild-looking young native had slipped from his camel and walked up to edgar staring fixedly at him edgar not knowing what to make of the movement shifted his rifle forward when the native gave a wild cry edgar edgar gazed at him with stupefaction it was rupert's voice but how could this wild figure be rupert how could he be here edgar do you not know me i am rupert edgar could doubt no longer he flung himself from his camel and rushed into his brother's arms am i mad or dreaming he exclaimed as he still failed altogether to recognize rupert in his disguise it is rupert's voice surely but it cannot be rupert it is me sure enough edgar and you are neither mad nor dreaming but this hair edgar said still bewildered gazing at the wild unkempt locks it is a wig neither more nor less edgar made for me at cairo and a first-rate job too edgar could doubt no longer but with the certainty and joy a certain weakness seemed to come over him and he would have fallen had not rupert seized him stand up old boy it is all right and natural enough we heard at metama of your having been carried away and as of course i wasn't going to let you remain a slave among these fellows i got leave of absence from wolseley got a disguise and a first-rate guide and thank god i have come to you at last the surprise of el bakhat at seeing this meeting between muley and this young native was much greater than that of the other arab who had heard at el obed the evening before that the white slave was journeying in disguise with his captor this is my brother sheik edgar said to him he has come all this way in disguise to look for and rescue me he has done well the sheik said warmly while amina clapped her hands in pleasure is the story about the pursuit after us true edgar asked yes quite true the horsemen will not be many hours before they overtake us a hurried consultation was held between the two sheiks and it was decided to strike off to the southeast again and as soon as the followers arrived with the camels the united parties left the road and made across the country edgar taking his place on the camel behind rupert he still felt like one in a dream and even now could scarce believe that it was really rupert who was riding before him the latter who had been looking forward to the meeting 
was yet scarcely less surprised at what had taken place it had seemed such a hopeless task looking for edgar over so wide an expanse of country that he could scarcely credit that he had succeeded in finding him and for a time the feelings were so deep on both sides that hardly a word was spoken it was not indeed until the camels came to a halt late in the evening that they began to talk naturally End of chapter 20